Why does a veil have to exist? You want to know that the data behind the computation is verifiably available. In testnet, of course, many of them are using. In production, a few L2s have started using it. Really? Coming soon. I read the jam paper. At least I claiming I, that you I read it is a big, big lift. <laughs> I have a veil today and say you have dot. You yeah. want to contribute to a veil security, directly stake dot yeah. to a veil and increase a veil security. Governance will decide. Yes. No, I, 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 I know the motherfuckers who came in there and fucked around with your testnet. Those guys are evil. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> Space Monkeys, blasting off with Prabal Banerjee. He's the co-founder of Avail. And we are very lucky to have him with us. Prabal, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. It was a very interesting presentation you had on stage here at Sub-Zero. We're definitely going to encourage people to go and check that. But for people from our ecosystem who might not know or anybody watching, can you give us a quick overview of the mission of Avail? Why does Avail have to exist? So at Avail, we are trying to create the unification framework, a modular application development stack, which contains data availability, yeah. a multi-asset shared security, and a interoperability piece. So we are trying to create that modular framework, which anyone can use to interact with multiple types of blockchains in a scalable manner and a secure manner. Well done. I love it. Okay, so we have data availability, multi-asset uh, shared, shared security, yes. and interoperability. Yes. Let's unpack all of those. Data availability, why is this even important in blockchains? So essentially, if you look at the Ethereum land in the last few years, you yeah. will see that they have taken an aggressively Ethereum focused on roll-up centric roadmap. Yep. What that essentially means is that when you cannot scale the base layer, you create these roll-up frameworks on top mm -hmm. and these roll-ups individually scale computation, but the base layer only acts as the security layer for them. Right. And when these rollups want to go and scale more and more, they are essentially limited by data availability. That mm. is, you want to know that the data behind the computation is verifiably available. Hmm. So suppose you have hundreds of thousands of users on a particular rollup. Okay. You just cannot trust that the rollup operator did its job correctly. You have to verify it. In yeah. order to verify it, you not only need, let's say, a zero knowledge proof or an optimistic proof, but you also need to know that the data published behind that computation is available and you can retrieve it and you can reconstruct it. You can re-verify all of it yourself if you would have wanted to. And who's who's the actor you're talking about here? Who is that that actor who needs to verify? So we want to see a world where the user is that actor. So oh. a user, even not knowingly inside their wallet, are able to verify that the rollup did it all its tasks correctly. And that is why we are building this data availability layer that not only supports the rollup developer to scale, yeah. but also allows a user to sample effectively. So Ooh. what we have is what we call as data availability sampling, mm -hmm. which is you only download bits and parts of the data, but still still get very high cryptographic guarantees that the entirety of data is available. And how, how do we know that that data is true? How do we know that we can trust or we don't need to trust Avail? So this is why you use a KZG cryptographic commitments against that data and you sample against those commitments. Oh. So the cryptographic commitment provides a succinct way to represent that data and then sampling allows you to verify against that commitment so that you do not need to trust any operator for doing its task. Now, once you have the DA guarantees, you also need execution guarantees and execution guarantees can be of many shapes and forms. For example, they can be a ZK proof which means that in a few hundred KB proof and a 60 millisecond to 100 millisecond time, yeah. you have verification that the entire data that you're getting from a roll-up operator is verifiably correct. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of the data availability landscape? It's not only Avail doing this modular DA offering, there are other projects too. Could you please tell us some of the, the leaders in the space? So there are many, many of us are trying to attempt the same problem with yeah. different sets of trade-offs is what I would like to say. Nice. Right? And then uh, there is, for example, Celestia, they came into production first. Uh, they are one of the pioneers in the data availability space. The trade-off that they chose is they use hash-based algorithm, mm -hmm. which is more efficient in terms of computation, but then you need to rely on optimistic 
proofs. So you need to rely on fraud proofs to be able to know whether the data is actually available or not. There yeah. are, of course, other trade-offs that they make in terms of tendermint and the Cosmos SDK yeah. and uh, number of validators and the security and such. Yeah. But all that aside, the core primitive of DA is fraud proof secured mm. in case of Celestia. Whereas for us, we are validity proof secured because of the KZG commitment that I was talking to you about. Gotcha. Before. And that's a little bit more expensive, but also... Yes, but it's verifiable. It doesn't need to rely on fraud proofs, which means gotcha. that there is no challenge period. You mm -hmm. do not need to wait in a limbo whether there is a fraud proof and mm -hmm. there is no fraud proof. Mm -hmm. So fraud has happened or not yeah. is not cost costly. You is very cost effective because you have a validity proof that, that that there is no fraud proof. Celestia, Avail, are there any others that are kind of at the forefront there? Yes. So there is also, let's say, for example, EigenDA and yep. similar constructs. Sure. EigenDA is more of a data availability committee construct where mm -hmm. they rely on a small set of committee to attest to the fact that the data is available. To keep things in perspective, we ask users to verify it themselves through data availability sampling. So it is yeah. self-verifiable. Okay. They rely on a committee of attestation. Mm. So it is crypto economic. Mm -hmm. If you rely on the crypto economic guarantees of those operators, mm -hmm. then you would know that your data is available. In Avail's case, for example, mm -hmm. you can verify it yourself. So that's why we have been working on a peer-to-peer -peer layer, a peer-to-peer -peer overlay, so that even if Avail chain itself gets corrupt, the data, it still would be available. And you can verify it, more like a torrent system, right? Yeah. So for example, gotcha. if you publish a film onto a torrent, uh, and it's very hard to then pull it back, mm -hmm. because now many people have it collectively. Yeah. We use the same thing on the flip side mm. to say that the data once published is very hard to now censor. Where is Avail as far as production ready goes, uh, customers using it? Are we still testing it out? Where are so we? Avail is already in production. We yep. have the mainnet running from July. Nice. And uh, we have almost 50 plus modular chains and 130 plus signed partners huh. at this point. In testnet, of course, many of them are using in production. A few L2s have started using it. Really? But a lot of them are lined up. So coming soon. Is the bottleneck just getting everybody on board or what's yeah, the... Yeah, the integration is the bottleneck. Yeah, right. right. So the Which is going to get smoother. Yes. Yeah. So the roll-up stacks are still getting ready. They are still only using, let's say, Ethereum as the DA layer. Or they are, for example, even if they use an alt DA, for example, they are not using the bridge efficiently. So getting all of those pieces together is the last mile, which always yeah. takes the last time. I get it, yeah. We often see these tech stacks compared to each other with megabits per second. Is, is that a useful metric to measure DA uh, layers? I would argue that it is not. There are two key aspects to it, right? One is the megabits per second should be against some guarantee. It huh. cannot be arbitrary, right? Sure. So, for example, my upload speed is 100 megabits per second. Yeah. Hence, my data publication speed is that. That doesn't make any sense. What is the guarantee that you are getting? When you publish something, you need to get a guarantee back. Hmm. That is the metric. Now, the time to getting that guarantee is the metric against which data availability should be considered. Right. Gotcha. So that's one. Second is demand. You need to also think, like for example, in some of the, um, uh, you know, Rob's presentation was a great one. Yeah. And sorry if I'm referring to something that happened today. Everybody's gonna watch that, so don't worry. He talks about, let's say, one billion accounts. And yeah. he benchmarks it around, around, let's say, 100 million accounts. And that's fair because the demand is only up to that. I can talk about gigabits per second, but if blockchain transactional and state deltas are not that big, yeah. then what am I going to do with all that resources? Sure, totally. Every resource is costly, right? Mm. If someone is telling you that something is for free, they're either bullshitting you or they're putting something under the carpet. Yeah. And that's why every resource we can push, let's say, a 120 MB block, but we are doing only a 2 MB because once the demand hits, only then the supply should increase. Otherwise, it, the economics doesn't fit. Love it. Okay, so how does this work? Multi-asset yeah. shared security. So essentially, if you think about what a blockchain actually gives you, an L1, what does it actually give you? It gives you a strong crypto economic guarantee, right? The validator set ensures that there is enough economic guarantee at play there to be able to use that as a verifiable arbitrator. 
Hmm. Now you will see that all kinds of L ones today use one asset as their main asset, right? For for every operation, you use a single asset. Hmm. We were thinking how to top up the crypto economic security of Avail because you see that a single asset cannot be used to unify, as our vision goes, yeah. across all ecosystems. So yeah, we yeah. want to include other asset classes back into the base layer. Okay. So think of Avail not only being secured by Avail, but also ETH and DOT and SOL and so on. Not only that, mm. think of the rollups. A rollup which is coming today, they also might want to have a token of their own. Yeah. And they would love to contribute to the security of their base layer. Right? Mm. I am a rollup. Yeah. If I have no contribution on the security of my chain, then what is the role of my token? Right? And that is why we are trying to not only use existing asset classes back to the consensus okay. engine, okay. but also new asset classes of the rollups themselves. That's cool. Yeah. That's why we are trying to find a merged security asset class mm. back onto the base layer. We are heavily modifying nominated proof of stake, the grandpa finality gadget, the babe uh, block production engine, and we are doing all of this by even changing, let's say, uh, bits of the fragment algorithm to actually bake all of this back into the base layer. So no bullshitting of, you know, having multiple assets all fragmented, lying all across, yeah. and then doing a very synthetic kind of an agreement on top. We want to embed that agri agreement and back into the consensus engine itself. So like on Polkadot, for example, we have nominated proof of stake and we stake dot. Are you suggesting that you can stake all kinds of different crypto economic tokens yes. and their economic value is, is, is put at stake? Yes. So think of I, uh, cool. I, I have Avail today and say you have DOT. You yeah. want to contribute to Avail security. Sure. You don't need to, you know, change your asset from DOT to Avail sure. to contribute. Mm. You can directly stake DOT yeah. to Avail and increase Avail security. What is the trade-off there? What do you have to overcome? Because why doesn't everybody do that? Yes. So there are few key different economics at play here. The okay. first is, for example, you wouldn't want uh, a foreign asset to control super majority of your base base asset, right? Yeah, of course. Because then, uh, you know, you are worth, let's say, $10 and the other asset is worth uh, Five fifty dollars then the fifty dollars can overcome and bulldoze your consensus yeah so you would want to limit the amount of exposure that you have back at the economics level mm. the second is it's incredibly hard to do because of the volatility and the impermanent losses that you would have when you have multiple assets all of which are fluctuating right yeah, yeah. so what do you do with the uh, time to time uh, volatility that hits all asset classes mainly because we are talking about crypto like crypto industry and its tokens which are highly volatile in nature yeah so that's why there is need to be a very very you know pessimistic take a very uh, defensive kind of a take that we are taking just to make sure that yes you can add crypto economic guarantee but we do it in a staged manner we do it in a very controlled manner where we slowly induce more and more stake yeah. so as to create a stable ecosystem and not like like when something goes very, very high or very low, the yeah. system col collapses by itself. Because that's what I'm thinking, you know, some VCL2 where, the, you know, lots of TVL locked, the token is through the roof, and then two months later, it's nothing. And that completely compromises security. Yeah, that's why we are trying to make it as permissionless, but having a very strong governance layer in between so that these changes come in a very, very gradual manner. The governance will decide. Yes. Really? Yes. You guys don't have governance activated right now. We have a very, very simple form of governance. Yeah. We call it our governance V1. Cool. Essentially... You built custom. Yeah. yeah. We, we actually had the Polkadot governance baked in. Yeah. But in the testnet stage, we found out that we need a little bit more time to mature the community yeah. to actually hand over the entirety of it to them. Because no, there is I, a I, I, I know the motherfuckers who came in there and fucked around with your test net. Those guys are evil. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> That's what test nets are for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, they did a great service, I think. Uh, totally, yeah. The final piece you mentioned was interoperability. interoperability. And I think this is a little bit of what you were talking about on stage yes. today. Tell us about your approach. So essentially, if you think of the L2 space today, the L2 space is heavily fragmented in terms of user experience. You have 10 different L2s. Your assets are lying all over the place. Yeah. Even if you have the money all split all across, you cannot do your action 
on one single chain because you now yeah. need to go through 10 different bridges all having different wrapped tokens and hence your entire experience today is extremely fragmented mm -hmm. right now the core problem is that when two different l1s want to communicate with one another they are, when they are sovereign the crypto economics come at come at the junction right who, who who's telling the truth exactly the yeah. cosmos sdk and the cosmos world uh -huh. has been you know run facing this problem for a very long time in the l2 the base layer gives the security right so now you have a shared security but then you have an optimistic chain and a zk chain what do i wait for their challenge period do i wait for this uh, you know zk proof or so on yep. and then how do i operate through that what we are trying to do is we are trying to create something called nexus in nexus we are taking the zk proofs even the intermediate zk proofs from let's say zk uh, chains okay. and aggregating them together to provide one single source of truth mm. that is verifiable. Mm. So think of two different ZK chains. They were right now for the purpose of you know cost effectiveness, they defer their proof generation. They do it, let's say, every one hour, few hours, and so on. Yeah. We want to take the intermediate proofs, aggregate them together and then provide fast guarantees from the nexus layer itself okay so and and that that is how we gen we enable cross roll up contingent transactions does this only work with zk roll ups right now the yeah. template that we have yes yeah. but we are right now aggressively adding for economic guarantees on yeah. optimistic rollups because sure. that's also one big big gap that you cannot have only for zk rollups because you could generate a zk proof for yes. an optimistic roll exactly roll yeah and, and incorporate uh, for, it yes for example succinct op has done an incredible job of turning any op uh, stack chain into a zk rollup chain that's cool now uh the crazy thing is is that you're building all this on the substrate sdk why was that the right choice uh, to to build this, why didn't you you build on 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 Cosmos SDK or, or Tendermint or anything like that? Why is this right? So essentially, again, I can give a long winded answer, but the, for the purpose of time, yeah. short long story short, it uses Rust, use is uses nominated proof of stake, which is one of the best in the industry in terms of decentralization of stake. Yeah, and we it allowed us to change headers and like very core structures, which were very hard to do it in other chains. So that is why you know, very, very fast, decentralized, highly uh, customizable stack is what Substrate offered us. And cool. that's why we used it. And you're happy with it? What's, what's the biggest challenge working with Substrate? I think the biggest challenge right now is like keeping up with it, right? For example, the Polkadot community right now is moving towards a, a more jam-like approach. Yeah. And then if we have to think about what's the substrate uh, upkeep is going to look like because who is going to maintain that substrate SDK, whether it's going to be maintained or not, mm -hmm. even the shift from, let's say, the substrate repo to the mono repo was a big lift for us in wow. terms of engineering and okay. so on. So <laughs> those kind of upstream dependencies are always a challenge, but that's sure. A challenge that you take up when you choose the stack yeah right so we're just going 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 and then there's all these people downstream like hey like keep up yes. keep paddling yes yeah good stuff is there anything you see in the polka dot ecosystem that um, that interests you that you you think is um is cool or worth worth checking out i read the jam paper uh, at least i i'm i'm claiming that you i read it is a big big lift but <laughs> yeah uh, yeah totally i overall went through it i think that it is a very very fresh take cool um very deep uh, so i'm yet to understand all the concepts that are in involved there yeah but i would genuinely very excited for it like anywhere where we can scale blockchain systems yeah with or without a will which can actually have users not having to think about what chain they are using yeah i am super bullish i love it dude thank you very much for coming on the show thanks a lot for having me it was a pleasure